so great to have two panelists, uh, longtime friends of the Preservation Alliance with us today, um, Byron Champlin and Robert Wilson. Um, they both care deeply about special places and that's why they're connected to the Preservation Alliance and great efforts related to historic preservation and other cultural activities. Um, Byron's had a career in communications, uh, was a regional director of foundation and community relations, uh, and has been an effective board member on many arts, community development, and cultural boards, including the Preservation Alliances. Um, Bob Wilson, Robert Wilson, is also a former board member of ours, a uh, retired oral surgeon who's uh, kind of a legend, I think, in the fundraising world uh, in the greater Concord and New Hampshire surrounds. Um, I think you're like a Tom Brady or Yo-Yo Ma of, of uh, cultural board member fundraising. <laughs> I've never had an introduction like that before, Jennifer. Thank you. <laughs> it's helped a lot with Canterbury State. Yo-Yo Ma of fundraising. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and on the volunteer side, and I think uh, both these folks who you'll hear from a little bit later, we're going to do some Q&A. Um, they've certainly worked with staffed organizations of different sizes. But they're also, you know, very sensitive and, and understanding of what it's like to, uh, what the demands are on a small um, volunteer organization. They also know what it's like to be a, a busy volunteer trying to um, get work done and sustain interest and energy over time. Um, so we just hope you take away some practical ideas from this session. I know for me, it's always an opportunity to kind of. Um, reset or think about plans that you already have and also just hopefully get a little more um for a couple more ideas so that you can get what you need to get done. So I'm going to start just by showing five slides on, um, on some big concepts and then we're going to go back and forth with Bob and uh, Byron a little bit on just some kind of ideas to tease out some strategies, techniques, ideas like that and then I'm going to open it up and really want to hear your questions and suggestions um, in the second half of the program. Sound good? Sounds good. Sounds good, ready to roll. Uh, let me pull up this little PowerPoint. Um, share. Okay, everybody can see that okay? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I think all of you know this, but I just feel like we always have to repeat it. Where does the money come from? And just important for you to have these stats to share with colleagues as you're making decisions about how to spend time in fundraising. Um, we know LCHIP, we're so happy to have LCHIP, we're so happy to have most plate grant programs in New Hampshire, um, but we have to always just remind ourselves that such a huge percentage of dollars in private philanthropy is coming from individuals. Um, and, and corporations and foundations, again, really important. But when you're thinking about how to use your energy, just really have to keep this uh, big picture in mind of so much of the dollars are coming from individuals. Um, I have three slides now that are, are pyramids in different ways, just to kind of tease out some ideas. Um, I think uh, you've probably talked about pyramids with your organizations. You know that effective fundraising tends to, to follow that shape in different ways, whether it's a capital campaign for building uh, purchase or restoration, whether it's your year-end campaign that you do every year, trying to get dollars at year-end, or you're picking a different platform like a GoFundMe campaign. Just, just a reminder to always be thinking in terms of um, that there are all these different level of donors, you need to give them all attention and they're all really important. I think, you know, we see time after time uh, that sort of in a trap of people spending a long time, a lot of their effort kind of at the, the bottom of the pyramid because it feels easier and not setting themselves up with lead gifts and talking to major donors so that they can have a really effective full campaign. So definitely something to be thinking about as you're getting started, also a really important reset. Um, I think it's whether you're talking about people who give year to year for an organization, or you're thinking about where you are in capital campaign fundraising, um, it's just a good double check too to see how are we doing in these different levels. And it doesn't have to be a, a huge administrative task. I think you know how things are falling in your own organization, but just 
stopping to think about where you are is, is really important. Um, this is a different kind of pyramid. Um, I, I don't know how they came up with so many I words on that side. That's a lot of I words. Um, but this is all about you know, the whole concept of bringing people in, moving them up in terms of levels of donations, but also level of commitment. Um, again, within a campaign structure, if you're trying to do one specific project, and certainly if you're a historical society or some other kind of organization that um, is looking for um, that good return on investment of spending money, spending time, sorry, on people who are already giving you money and trying to get them even more committed to your project or committed to your organization. Um, and this is a kind of a funny different look at that same sort of concept, kind of more with an organizational structure on it. Um, and again, it's about level of commitment, um, how you're just trying to keep these different uh, kinds of donors in mind and trying to move them to being um, as deeply committed to your to your organization or to your specific project as possible. And also just kind of reinforcing the different ways that people give and how you might be attracting that kind of financial support. Um, my last slide is just some classic comments again. Um, people give to people. So those relationships and identifying uh, who you can bring in is, is so, so important. Um, the first bullet is, is the uh, kind of the what is um, you, you have the relationship and how are you conveying the importance, your message, the importance of that contribution of um, time or money um, to something that's going to matter to that person as well as to your community, however you're defining community and its impacts. Um, successful fundraising starts with a plan. We're going to talk a little bit more about that with Bob and Byron in a minute. And then that um, a key figure that's also important to share with um, uh, people you work with. It's often forgotten about how much cultivation and stewardship really matters um, in a capital campaign sort of situation or uh, with ongoing organizational support that you're seeking. So um, let's, let's dig into some of those ideas a little bit more and I'm happy to talk more of those about those kinds of things um, as we get going. Um, so to Byron and Bob, we were just going to start with a question of about that plan. Um, Byron, I'll call on you first. Sort of, what do you think of as the key elements of a plan? Who would you involve? Um, you know, knowing again that most of the folks here with us today are um, volunteer organizations, may or may not have done fundraising before. Are you unmuted? Let's see. Nope. We all get to pause for a minute. Ask to unmute. Thank you. I had I, I had this problem earlier, and uh, I had a little black background noise here, so I muted myself, and then I couldn't unmute myself again. So I apologize for that. Um, I think a little louder too, Byron. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Sorry. This uh, my microphone is also very directional on my uh, on my computer, so I apologize. So, um, what are the elements of a successful plan? Was that the question, uh, Jennifer? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, organization is fundamental, <laughs> but also, I mean, I think Bob has said this before, and so I don't want to steal his thunder, but fundraising is really about storytelling. Uh, so you have to have a story. I mean, to me, the bedrock of, of, of raising funds is to figure out what story you're telling, you know, and that means, and, and I mean, what is, what is it that you want to resonate with a potential prospective donor? Uh, that will motivate them to support your organization, to support your cause, uh, and and to uh, back up that support with uh, with financial uh, with their financial means. Uh, so I think that you really have to sit down and figure out what is it, uh, you know, in in a in a uh, Madison Avenue sense, what is it that you're selling, uh, and and make sure that you have that uh, that nailed down very very firmly. Because you need, you want to be, you want to then make sure that all of your communications, for example, reiterate and underscore your your story. Second the element to me is, who are your friends? You know, who are the people who are naturally inclined to support your story? To 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 you know, those people for whom that story in your circle is going to resonate. 
Um, I was involved with a, uh, an organization, which was not at that time a nonprofit, uh, but uh, which was a, a museum. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into the details, but as we were talking about them transitioning to become a nonprofit that would then have to go out to donors, we discovered that they had never kept a catalog of people who had given them gifts. They had had people walking in the door for years, uh, actually more than a decade, who had written checks spontaneously to support the organization, and nobody had kept a spreadsheet with names and addresses and amounts. So as they were looking at becoming a nonprofit, they suddenly realized that they had not done anything to, to uh, capture who their friends were. Yeah, uh, so right. that's really important. You, know, you need to know who your friends are, know who your prospective friends are, and be organized and, and keep that, their contact information organized. Um, those okay. are the, yeah, those are the first two things that come off, uh, off the top of my head. And I, I defer to, you know, to get, I like to get Bob involved in this too, because uh, to me, as you said, Bob, Bob really is the master. Uh, so Bob? Well, the institution that's going to be uh, establishing a capital campaign uh, has to have people to do it. And so uh, if, if the organization is strictly volunteer, in other words, there's no professional staff and there are so many uh, small historical societies uh, house museums and things of that sort that do not have a professional staff. They're relying solely on volunteers. And it's nice when there's someone in the organization that is in a leadership position who has a business background because they'll understand what it takes to sell the product. Uh, as you said, Byron, uh, Madison Avenue does have a message and the medium is the message. And so I think that uh, someone in the organization has to be identified as the, as the person that is going to be comfortable leading uh, a process uh, in which they're going to have to recruit others like them to participate in the fundraising. Uh, they have to have a passion for what they're doing. Uh, if they don't believe in it, if you have people on a campaign who say, oh, I'll just help you. I know you need help raising money, so I'll help you. And that's the sort of kiss of death as far as someone joining your organization to fundraise. They have to, first of all, believe in what you're doing and secondly, they have to be fearless. Uh, I've often said to people who ask me to uh, coach them or whatever, uh, if you ask someone for money, they're not going to hit you. They may <laughs> say no, but the big thing is they're going to respect you because they're gonna say, I could never do that. I could never ask people for money. And so getting organized, you have to have someone who is going to be a leader who understands organization. Usually that's a business person uh, who has had to deal with a bottom line and a payroll. And those people can then say, okay, uh, I know how to put this, a group of people together and to get them organized. Uh, if it's strictly, if there is a professional staff, it's much easier because in that sense, they can be, uh, they've, I'm sure that most professional staff has had uh, fundraising counseling. Just ask Jennifer Goodman, she'll tell you uh, how many uh, seminars that she's gone to on fundraising. And so to have a professional person on your staff that has that background is very helpful in getting organized. I've gone to a lot of seminars, but I've learned more from talking to people like Bob and Byron, I would have to say. Um, and I also, we always coach people to talk to other people in town that have been through similar things, whether it was a recent library project or something down the road. And I know, you know, people who have ended up with award-winning projects from the Preservation Alliance are always, almost always happy to talk to somebody who's at an earlier stage. Byron, you were going to say something, sorry. 
Yeah, I was going to say that um, you know you also need to think about like uh, what are the elements of your fundraising plan, and and what are the elements of your fundraising. Bob touched on a capital campaign, but capital campaigns are not the only fundraising that or, or nonprofit organizations do. That is you know, very true. Are, are you a membership organization? Do you have members who pay an annual fee? Do you have an annual fund? Yeah. You know, uh, you know, if you don't, is that something you should do? Which is at the end of the year, an annual appeal or sometime in the year, make an annual appeal for, for, for a separate gift, as a gift separate from membership. Um, you know, uh, then, you know, do you need to run a capital campaign? Do you have a, a structure or something like, uh, or a building that you need to invest capital in? And you need to raise the capital for that. One of the advantages of being either a membership organization or being an organization that has, a, has an annual fund, for example, an annual appeal is that you automatically have a starting point for your capital campaign. You have a database, and I hate to use that term because it makes people think about a computer and everything, and it can be off-putting uh, to people of a certain age, but, but what I mean to say is, do you have a list? I mean, do you have that list of people who have given you money traditionally? Because that's your, that's your donor pool. Absolutely. So, so think about what kind of, of, of uh, fundraising plan you want, how many components you want to have of it, in it. We talk a little bit about um, cultivation and stewardship next. Um, I mean, I think we can focus it on it for individuals, but it obviously relates to relationships with businesses or foundation decision makers too. Um, again, wearing the hat of, you know, this isn't, um, Harvard with a staff of, you know, 25 stewarding people in different parts of the world. This is volunteers. Um, I, I think that, you know, that figure that I showed before is a little overwhelming that you need to be spending so much time with cultivation and then stewardship. What are, what are some ideas you'd like to share? And, and, and with that mindset of, um, especially for volunteers, what's, what's practical, what has a good return on investment? How do you get other people sort of bought into that concept? Um, Bob, do you want to go first this time? Sure. Um, when Byron talked about an organization that has members, uh, that really, that is, is where you begin your cultivation. Um, why are they members? Uh, are they interested in what you're doing? Are they interested in, in where you are? Uh, what is the focus of your organization that compels people to say, I would like to belong to that group? And, and then um, the idea of cultivation is literally um, like agriculture. You have to fertilize. You have to talk to the plant very, very nicely. Uh, you have to have something interesting that draws them in. And so cultivation uh, is not something that happens overnight. Uh, cultivation needs to be thought of as a long-term process that really relies, relies upon communication over and over and over again, so that uh, they're aware of what you are, what you're doing, why you're doing it. And, and by uh, educating them, you can cultivate their interest so that, yes, I'd like to be a member of that organization. They're doing something that I think is worthwhile that I'm interested in. And uh, once, once you get them as members, then, you need to cultivate that membership into action. In other words, to make them volunteers. They can be simply a volunteer that tells other people, you know, you really should belong to the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. They're doing great work around the state. Uh, I'd like to send you some material about what they're doing. I think you're gonna enjoy it. And that's the sort of cultivation that brings more people in because the more people that you have involved in your organization, the easier it is then to go to the, that pool of people, expand it, 
and your finances should flow from that. Yeah, Aaron, I, would you like to add? Oh yeah, of course. Um, you know, every you should use every opportunity you have to capture information, contact information uh, from the people who attend your events or who uh, who communicate with you or who express an interest in what you do. Um, and then, you know, that's kind of the, and, and, and that's the starting point of cultivation. You know, then you invite them to events or you draw them in further. Um, and once they are, you know, identified as a supporter, the second phase is, you know, what we call the stewardship part. Uh, and that's basically maintaining that relationship. And a great way to do that is communications. And that's, there's work involved in that. And I realize it. Your communications don't have to be any more sophisticated than a regular email. You know, capture email addresses from people and send them an email newsletter on a quarterly basis or whatever is, is practicable for your organization. Um, uh, you know, most everybody has email, email these days. Uh, you know, another way to do it, again, you know, this is a little bit more of a technological lift, but create a Facebook page or a Facebook account and get people to like you on Facebook. And, and uh, if, they have, if they have Facebook, um, you know, that's, a, that's another way to tie them to you and then share your information. I mean, take a picture of what you're doing and post it on Facebook with a, with a, with a short message. Uh, you know, uh, that, that's, a, that's another way. But essentially, um, you know, what, what you want to be doing is to finding ways to identify people to tell your story to and then continue to tell that story in interesting uh, and different ways. Um, uh, and, and, and that uh, will tie them to you uh, and that will you know, develop them from interested people to supporters to, uh, to donors. Yep, yep. I, I think it's a mindset too of um, everything that you're doing already. <laughs> is there a way to add something on that would be of interest to a donor? So, um, you know, you're, you're just got a, you just hired a contractor for X. Is it newsy just to send a little note to your lead uh, donors to let them know that? Or you got a great story in the paper um, or you're doing a little site visit one day. It doesn't always, isn't always a fit, but can you add to that by inviting in key donors or key prospects? Just kind of like that extra layer of activity in a way that um, I know a lot of you are doing this already. Um, I wanted to ask you too about common mistakes. I'm also interested in a little role play ask. Would people like to hear a little role play ask? I can't see you. <laughs> I think it's yeah. So we didn't rehearse this, but let's do a little role play ask just to get across some key elements. And then I'm going to ask my two panelists about some um, common mistakes and then we're going to open it up and um, I know um, Bill Franklin asked some really important questions about a lot of them had to do with sustaining efforts and um, communication with donors and having the how do you find how do you find the energy um, and keep both the solicitor engaged your volunteers as well as your donors engaged and and, and try not to fall into the fatigue trap, which is a very real trap. Um, so in the role play, Bob, uh, not to put you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot. Let's pretend Byron is um, John Smith and we're, you need to ask him for money for the gas holder in Concord, the great last of its kind in the country. Um, we've been working Byron for months now He's come to some public events on the gas holder. Um, he gave $100 early to help buy lawn signs. Um, we know that he gave, um, uh, how much did he give? John Smith gave $25,000 to um, uh, another project on another side of town that had some similar qualities. Um, you've known him for a while. You finally get him to lunch. Um, just a little bit about what you actually say and what you wait for, what you want to share a little bit with us? Sure. 
Uh, let's see, this is John Smith, you say? John Smith is Byron, yeah. We didn't want to make it too personal for him. <laughs> what are you having for lunch? <laughs> um, Mediterranean chicken salad looks good to me, Bob. Okay, me too. I'll, I'll have that and uh, we can close this off and go over lunch. Uh, <laughs> um, so the John, waitress has left. <laughs> John, I just, uh, I just want to tell you how thankful we are for what you have done already uh, for the gas holder. Uh, I, I'm not telling you anything that's a secret, but I'm just absolutely passionate about saving that building because once it's gone, it's gone. It's never coming back and you can't ever duplicate it because then it's simply a recreation and not the authenticity that people are looking for. And what you have done in your philanthropy towards this project, uh, I just thank you so much. And I'm just hopeful, you know, that as we go forward with this and you see the success that's going on, uh, I'm hopeful that you would get one or two more friends of yours who may not be thrilled with this, but I want you and those two or three other people that you might bring along to come with me and go down there. Uh, I know that you've seen it, but I'll bet they haven't seen it. And, and I think that uh, if we can get people to see what this is all about, I think you'll agree with me that what you did over there um, at the Kimball Jenkins in restoration of that building, um, oddly enough, built approximately the same time uh, that you can see that this, like Kimball Jenkins, the estate is an anchor for that end of town. And that what you have done in, in contributing your time and effort and money to this, I think is terrific. The opportunity should come along and, and you find that, uh, you know, a, a month or two from now that it might be possible, you know, to uh, get on board with this match that Peter Jones has put up. Uh, I'm going to contribute towards that match and maybe we could talk about you might doing a little more towards that match as well. But most of all, I just want to thank you for everything that you've done and hope that, you know, that we might, with another couple people, carry this even further. Well, thanks. Well, thanks Bob. You're very kind. I, my, my support has been very modest up till now. Uh, but I, I, think, I think I know a couple of folks in town who I might be able to bring down there. Um, what's the scope of the support that you're, that you're looking for? Well, as you know, uh, we have in hand uh, two gifts, one from uh, Liberty Utilities and one from an unknown source. Uh, and the unknown source is a matching grant. That's $500,000. And so um, if, it's, if it is something that you could consider, something in the range of somewhere between 25 and $50,000 uh, over a period of time, uh, no one has really said yet uh, how far in advance this is going. Uh, they're talking about a rather long-term process, but getting this thing stabilized has to happen this year. So the funds that we're looking for this year if it could be in that range, John, it would be just wonderful. Well, you know, you know more than anybody, Bob, that you know you can only support so many, uh, so many really good causes. But uh, you're right uh, about the about the the aspect of the gas holder that it's it's an anchor in the south end, just like Kimball Jenkins has been an anchor in the north end, and of course, you know, uh, Susie and I have been very committed to that project. Um, let me do this. Let me let me let me sit down and chat with Susie and see how she feels about about the project and and uh, and and I, I I certainly would give it consideration and, and we will give it serious consideration and uh, is it soon enough if I get back to you in uh, in two or three days? 
uh, two or three days would be terrific. I was about to suggest, why don't we set a date for lunch 10 days from now? That sounds perfect. And bring Susie. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> oh, look, here's my Mediterranean ah. chicken sandwich. <laughs> Here come, I'm the waitress delivering now. I haven't interrupted. <laughs> well, thank you for doing that role play. I heard a lot of great um, sentiments in there and I'm sure the rest of you did too um, about um, referencing past support, offering an opportunity, uh, waiting to hear back, trying to do listening, not just talking. All those things are really um, key to success. Another important thing is that, that, that Bob very skillfully put in a pitch for more supporters. If yep. you notice yep. that at the very top. And he, that was not only a way that, that he very skillfully eased into actually asking me for more money, but it also set up the opportunity to expand the giving circle. Yep. And he also talked about his own support, which is really important too. Yep. Hmm. Well, thank you for that. Um, why don't I open it up? And um, does anybody have any, want to unmute themselves or raise their hand? Um, Bill, I know we want to get to your topics. Does anybody have any questions about what we've said so far? This is no right answers, no wrong answers. Feel free to chime in. Okay. Okay, Chuck, we're gonna Chuck and then we're gonna to go to some of Phil's questions after Chuck. You wanna just introduce you yourself? Nicole, are you helping with muting or should I do that? Yeah, uh, I'm clicking on the thing. Okay. Yay. All right. I was, uh, of course, uh, fascinated to hear um, the give and take between uh, uh, Byron and, and, and Robert, but I found it uh, centered largely on uh, someone who has already been identified as a philanthropic uh, uh, adherent to giving. Um, I think it's important to when you when you want to know your donors, if you will, that you have a good pitch for why it might be important to them, uh, financially, um, geographically, uh, and, you know, and from any number of angles like that, so that uh, you can say, well, you know, I'm I'm very much interested in preserving this particular uh, project. Um, you know, why do you think this would be good for you individually uh, if you were to contribute to it in some way? And uh, when they reveal, for instance, that, well, I'm a realtor and, you know, I've, I've been, you know, interested in properties. You go, well, you know, th this particular property is really going to affect uh, the, the sales opportunity for people that are attracted in this particular demographic group right, and, and make it a, a, a very uh, economically attractive relationship so that they're getting something for what they are giving you, even, it may, even if it is disproportionate. But most of the time, uh, you know, restaurants, things like that, uh, they know that increased economic opportunity uh, means that they're going to have increased business. So anytime you can create an, a, a project that is going to have some kind of destination value, um, it lifts all boats in economic opportunity from the small guy to the large guy. Yep. But you have, you. To, uh, you have to identify why it's important to them other than just because they happen to be people that uh, uh, have historically uh, felt they were the noblesse oblige or whatever. You speak to a really important point, and that is to know, to know, that is to know your prospective donors. 
uh, you know, to, to be aware of, of, of them and their and, and what the possible interest points are, you know, between them and, and your and your project. Which comes usually from just people sitting around the table and brainstorming about what they know about different people, right? And then I think, Chuck, you're also saying just making sure you're listening and sort of asking some questions to tease out even more about what would attract them potentially to this project. So yes, well, so the, the longer you can talk to somebody, uh, the more likely you are to find um, a hook. Yeah, yeah. So they will tell you. They will tell you what they're interested in if you listen. Yep, yep. Well, it, it's, it's getting them to listen because their their first obligation to their financial interest is no. So you have to get beyond that rejection, that immediate rejection, and say, well, you know, you're missing an opportunity because. Right. Yep, opportunity. Yep, that's great. Great word. Um, so Phil's been leading an incredible campaign in Bartlett. Um, uh, they've been at it for four and a half years now. I don't know how many people are in that same category with sort of an extended capital campaign or multiple phases of a building related project. But uh, Phil had shared some really, can you unmute him, Nicole? And I just, Phil had shared some very thoughtful questions um, in advance about kind of what they're going through. Um, Phil, do you want to give a little summary of that for the group or? Uh, sure, you would do I'd be better happy to. And then we can try to get to some of your questions that okay. really have a lot to do with communication <laughs> with donors and how do you keep the energy up in a, in a long campaign? Right. Um, our campaign um, really is focused on, on doing something that is going to raise um, or open a cultural um, avenue here in Bartlett. And for those, for those who don't know, I don't know, sometimes when I say Bartlett, people look at me and say, where's that? So <laughs> where's that? <laughs> we're up in the White Mountains, uh, a small little town of about 3,200 people, um, just northwest of North Conway. Um, so um, you may have heard of Glen and Intervale and Bartlett Village. We're all Bartlett. So um, back in 2016, um, actually started a couple of years before that, the, um, the Bartlett School District owned a, uh, a, a closed church here in town. It was the St. Joseph Church. It, it was closed in 1999 and they used it as a storage facility for about oh, 15 or so years, never really took care of it. So the building deteriorated dramatically. They were proposing to tear the building down. We um, stepped in because this church happens to be the first um, Catholic church in the Mount Washington Valley. So it has historic value. And we had, we, we along with um, Andrew Cushing, who used to work for the Preservation Alliance, uh, put together a, a rather thick package of documentation. And we got the building um, listed on this uh, state register of historic places. We also in 2017 were awarded the tw uh, one of the seven to save designations for the building. So it has, <laughs> excuse me, it has value from a historic perspective. We started a capital campaign at the end of 2016. At that point in time, we were just looking at, I, I would say just, we were looking for about $175,000. The money came in slowly and prices continued to rise. And lately the prices have been rising dramatically. So we are up to a campaign right now of, our estimate is $535,000. We've raised, approximately $312,000, which is great. Absolutely great. We have done, uh, we've broken the project into uh, several phases, two main phases actually. Uh, but within there, there were sub projects that were going on. But the, the, the main beginning part of the project was to save the building because the building itself was that deteriorated that um, our general contractor um, and I had to agree with him, uh, felt that the building had about one more year of heavy snow on the roof and it was gonna be flat on the ground. Our intention with this building for the Historical Society um, is to turn it into a museum so that we are 
uh, presenting the history of Bartlett, a heart's location, and then uh, and the broader Mount Washington Valley. Now, we've got a lot of moral support for this project. And we actually, from what you've just heard, we do have some, uh, some pretty significant financial support. Many, many donors are repeat donors, which is great. Um, we've received donations from $5, which is, which, you know, it's, as far as that person's concerned, that's what they can afford. And we appreciate that. The largest donations we, re, re, we have received was a $20,000 um, stock um, donation, which we um, cashed in and, and took the $20,000. So it's been a, a bunch of smaller donations. So this is one of the reasons I'm concerned about donor fatigue, because we've, while we've seen new donors come along recently, most of the donors that we have are through our membership and we have a number of people who have donated to us who are non-members. So people, for example, Bartlett has a lot of second homeowners. Um, and uh, so a number of people from mostly uh, the New England states um, have made donations who aren't members of our historical society. Although interestingly enough, many of those people who were uh, non-donors have converted to become members of the Historical Society. So that's a great thing. And it, and it tells us we're doing that's something right. So, <laughs> uh, so who's anyway. That, who's doing the work, um, Phil? Is it a committee of Historical Society members? Is it, I bet it's mostly you. Is it? Who, to to doing, doing the work to raise the money? Yes. Uh, well, you're pretty much looking at the guy right now. <laughs> oh. I do have some help from some other people. Um, but they're very part-time. Um, when people talk about the project, they look at me. Yeah. Um, so I guess I put myself in that position, which is fine. I, I accept that. Um, and I, and Jennifer knows that, you know, we, I'm not giving up on this. We're, we're going to make it. <laughs> I just wish it would come along a little sooner. Yeah. So, um, what, you know, another question I have is we, I've run across a number of people up in our area here who are very committed to other organizations. And we've approached them to, you know, there's a gentleman who just gave three and a half million dollars to uh, the North Conway Library up here. Um, and we had approached him and he turned, he wouldn't even talk to us. He just turned us down flat. We had somebody who was a friend of his try to talk to him. And he still didn't want to talk about this project. Um, there are other people who give to, um, as a matter of fact, I've had this said to me where um, there's another, some other people that want to approach and they've said, well, they're all devoted to this other nonprofit organization. So my, one of the questions I have is, how do you break into a group of people or individuals like that who are committed to something else, very committed to something else? And you, you just kind of role played that a little bit in your in your um, in your role play situation there, but these are people who who um, it will tell you right out right off the bat. I, I am involved with that period. Um, how what do, do I get? Bob and Byron, why don't why don't we start with that and just um, how do I get that some door people open? Who you're never going to convince, but what what what's some advice? What would give hope to Phil? You two, Bob move and on. Byron, move on. Yeah, move on. I say too. You okay. have to get to them. If, 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 they, if they give you a hard no like that, but Todd, go ahead. You know better than I do. Chuck, what did you want to say to that? Uh, he's a member of the community. Uh, the, the, the individuals I'm trying to reach? Yes. Yeah, actually, they, well, they live in the next town over, but in Jackson, but... but well, if, if, he have, if he has an interest in the community, some, yeah. kind, some kind of stakeholder interest, then he needs to participate. Mm -hmm. And if, if <laughs> and I would recommend if he's reluctant to get deeply involved, uh, try to convince him that he could do a a small matching fund. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that that might that might get a, the toe in the door. Yep, it's possible. Now the other fun. the other thing I'd like to recommend just has nothing to do with necessarily how you approach people. But in Bartlett, um, 
there's this yeah you got to get through Bartlett to get where you want to go <laughs> whether it's bare notch or whatever that's right I, I would build a little toll booth and I would <laughs> I would I would set it up and say save St. Joseph's Church toll booth <laughs> I'm not sure the state would appreciate that but <laughs> well you're not you're not forcing people to go through your little toll booth set no, it up in, in a little parking lot where it's uh it's yep. convenient for people to drive through, and uh, you got a lot of tourists that go through Bartlett. If you can squeeze a couple of bucks out of them, you you wind up getting a <laughs> 100 bucks a day for 30 days. That's right. That would well, help. That roadside yeah, yeah. marketing is, has, has had unusually wonderful effects for some uh, properties as well. I, yeah. I think, Spill, back to your point, too, do you feel like you have good connections to those people? So can you be assured that you should move on or can you kind of triangulate and is it worth trying not yet to move on because somebody who knows those folks better yeah. would encourage you not to totally give up yet? I guess yeah. that's, May that's I a suggestion. Yeah, um, yeah sure, Bob. Uh, when, you go, when you go to, not necessarily this person, but others in the community who may say that um, I, I'm giving, well, you've already asked them. So I'm, I'm thinking perhaps of someone that you haven't asked yet, but you find out that they are a person of means that they have given uh, to other organizations, which may or may not be within the state or whatever, but to call them up and saying, hi, uh, this is who I am. And I'm, I'm hopeful that because you live here four months out of the year because I'm a, this is my second home. Uh, I'm wondering if you'd come over and look at this project that we're going through. And I'm wondering if you might give us some suggestions as to what we're doing, not the fundraising at all. You're not gonna mention money at all. Come right. over and see what we're doing. I have some questions because of your background that you have researched. Yep. If you know they have the skill uh, whether it's in timber framing or roofing or or interior design, uh, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. would you come over? Because I'm just asking if you might have some suggestions, and if you could come and see it, it would be very helpful to us. Right. We actually have tried that approach, and I've I've thinking of maybe three or four people that we've had in the building. Um, at various stages of the renovation process. And we are, by the way, we are working on renovating the building right now as, with as much money as we can. We spend it and we raise it and then spend it again. Um, so that has had more negative result than positive result. Again, um, people say, what a wonderful project you're doing. And then we get back to, but I support, you know, in, in, the, in the case of one gentleman who um, <laughs> ironically told me he didn't have any money, he was all tapped out. And then in the paper about a week later, I saw him giving a check of $100,000 to somebody. <laughs> so, so, okay. <laughs> People do lie, you know. Oh, yeah. But well, he was well-intentioned. The, the thing is with, with some of these people that I, I'd like to get to is, I need someone to make that introduction to me um, because these are people are, they, they are of means, they shelter themselves to a certain degree. They, they build that bubble around them so that you, you know, they don't, their number isn't handed out just readily. Let's right. put it that way. So I do have one person who I think I can make a contact with through another person, but I'm relying on that intermediary to make that contact. So a person should make it for you. Yes, and, and that's what we're trying to do is we're, we're, we're trying to get that per, the, the person I'm eventually like to get to as is either just back from Florida or will be back from Florida fairly soon. So, you know, it's, it's you a- it's do a, this. You can't do this all by yourself. You've been doing this now for four and a half years. Yeah, yeah. You're ready for the state hospital. <laughs> oh, don't say that, please. <laughs> I used don't to work do, for one of those kind of hospitals. A big gold badge. No, I would support that too. Is who can who can? I mean, it sounds like some people are helping you. How can you make it easy for them to be, um, you know, yeah. say, 
I, I just want to have for the next six months. Could you talk to me for 20 minutes every other Tuesday just to help move this along or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And people can help in all kinds of ways. They don't have to be the direct solicitors if they aren't fearless. Um, yeah. Or, are the people who have already donated, would they would look at that list and see if any of those people would help you? They want to see it be successful, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And another outlier I wanted to say that we always recommend is um, talking to your regional staff person at the Charitable Foundation. They want to, I mean, maybe you've all already done this, but they want to know what's up. They want to know what good investment possibilities yes, are in yes, their yes, yes. region. Yeah. So it's, Very I mean, good. it's not a magic bullet, but it's, a, it's an important and pretty easy thing. And you're not there asking for money. You're there saying, boy, we have an opportunity that right. some of your donors, and they've, they've helped open doors or yep. even little I, coaching, like, don't forget it's the, uh, the wife is making the decision, not just the <laughs> husband or... Yep. Make sure you make it sound more cultural than historic preservation, stuff like sure. that. Well, I just got off the phone with Ben Amston about- There you go, you're ago. good. <laughs> you're, I guess another thing to do is just tell you you're doing amazing work. Yes. And um, all of your questions about length and fatigue, I mean, flipping it the other way, you're doing incredible work. You've raised two thirds of the money. You've adapted as things shifted. You have a lot to show for it already. Um, I, I you're, maybe some of your friends can help you. The new people helping you can, just can help you celebrate that progress even more. Yeah, because um, yeah. you can only well, do so much. We, yeah. we do. And that was another question, that, and I see Chuck's got his hand up. Yeah. Uh, doesn't doesn't the train stop in Bartlett? <laughs> so we've talked to the railroad about that, um, and <clears throat> there is a clear at this point separation. Um, the train doesn't stop for that long. It just stops for a, a few minutes to switch the engine around. Um, th they Well, that sounds really, like something you are giving to the railroad and they're not giving you anything in return? Uh, not right now. Where is the equitable partnership with the people there that work know. and live and play in the, in, the, in the valley? I think you need to talk to Chuck every other Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so, I haven't given up on David's work yet. But, good, good, good. Uh, for, for I just, we're not going to be able to go extra deep or do too much more in this session, but I did want to introduce Nicole Flynn, who's our yeah. field service person. And we're happy to, um, you know, just set a time to talk for a half an hour or, and we're now, you know, fully vaccinated and getting on the road more. If you want to invite us to visit and brainstorm with um, you and your group, we're happy to do that. That's part of our core mission. Yep. Um, Phil, I know has more questions. I just wanted to make sure if there were other people who hadn't gotten a chance to talk yet, whether they had a direct question that we could be helpful with. Barbara, do you want to unmute everybody, Nicole? Can you do that? Um, we could sure. also, I could wrap in five minutes, but then if everybody, anybody wants to stay on a bit longer, we could stay on for another 15 if that's helpful. Barbara, did you want to? Um, I, I Some questions about the um, membership versus annual appeals, um, um, being on both sides where um, I'm, I usually do an annual um, donation to societies but then as I'm doing that donation, I find I get an, an annual appeal letter at the same time. So I've given a donation, but then they come back and say, but, but you didn't pay your membership. So, and, and that's like a very small portion, but I've given a significant donation. And so I, I'm figuring, oh, they just take it out of that big donation. So uh, does it get confusing for people um, that um, are not, tracking to you like you you know on your schedule what you would like to do for sending out for letters and things like that and and we do get um a newsletters quarterly that get um responses and donations um but then it seems like we are generating donor fatigue when all of a sudden somebody says oh we've, but we've got a, a matching fund to give um you and somebody's already donated and so then they didn't get the advantage of that matching fund. Um, and, and then um, you have an annual appeal where 
um, it's it's not clear. Um, I, I guess it's it, it just seems like you're writing checks and writing checks, and then on the other, right. and then another point I was um, wanted to ask about was payment fees. Um, as people are moving more towards using electronic payments, um, those fees are not insignificant, um, and so it, it just really cuts into what you're getting from your donations as well. Yeah. Yeah. Bob, did you want to? Who wants to react to that? I have some reaction, but to my panelists first. Uh, the separation so that if I understand what you're saying is that you're getting a membership appeal and an annual fund appeal practically on top of each other. Or I could have just held on to it because I do my donations at one time a year. Sure. I make a, a significant, I go through and, and make my donations all at the same time. Um, and sometimes that's about the same time somebody's sending out an appeal letter or I've, I've got it in my stack and that appeal letter is in that stack. Um, yes, yes, that's, that's very common. That's personally, you know, I will do that myself sometimes, uh, but usually membership and an annual appeal are two separate things. And a membership might go out in May and an annual appeal might go out in November. So that you could get, so it, it separates it because I, I understand what you're saying and a lot of people will say well, wait a minute I just I just gave you uh, X number of dollars uh, for my membership and now you're asking me for X number of dollars a week later or a month later you know for an annual appeal uh, they need to be psychologically separated at least by six months yeah. Well, and I think the donor's all, always right. So if the donor says, I, I don't want to be getting any more membership solicitations, hopefully whoever's doing the asking can deal with that from an administrative standpoint. Right. Um, but it's, and, and communicate the fact of why they do both. Or as you said, if there's a special campaign on top of everything else, you would hope that just in a, you know, with a phrase in the letter or a little note at the bottom, you know, the solicitor could be saying, um, you know, I, I know you already gave, thank you so much for the donation you already made this year. Here's why we're asking you again. Right. Uh, and also, is there a differentiation between the, what the money for the membership goes to versus the annual? Right, right, I mean, right. You know, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing you ask, uh, Barbara, oh. is, is isn't it is it is it like double dipping and is and does it create donor fatigue? I think that if right. you you know you need to make it very you really need to differentiate between what a membership goes towards and what money for the annual fund. That's excellent. Here. That is excellent. Yep. Yep. Chuck, I'm just going to hold you for a minute to say, is there anybody else who hasn't gotten to say anything yet that wants to pipe up or? So Nicole and I will and, uh, stay on for a little bit at the end if anybody wants to talk. Don't discount bake sales. I love that from Linda. It was another chat. <laughs> Jennifer, ba uh, Paul has his hand up. Okay, Paul. Thank you. Uh, it might be helpful and encouraging to just run through what we're doing in uh, East Derry. I've been working uh, as the lead for about 11 years now on uh, historic preservation work on the 1769 Meeting House at First Parish. This is where the uh, Ulster Scots first came to New Hampshire in 1719. The uh, church has been running continuously since then. This is the second meeting house they built. And we've been working these past uh, 10 or 11 years on uh, doing a lot of work to it. We've so far spent about $1.8 million we have a whole new foundation. We've completely rehabbed the steeple and the tower below it. We are nearly finishing an adjacent building that holds a very large elevator to provide accessibility to both the meeting house and the rest of the uh, modern church facility. We uh, have yet to do the uh, sanctuary at the, on the upper floor of the meeting house. It's been four years now since we've had a service in there. And then after that, we have to do the whole lower level, rebuilding rooms, and then the roof. Also this summer, we will be doing lead remediation and painting the whole exterior. So we've raised um, money from a number of sources. 
We've had uh, three successful LCHIP grants and three or four unsuccessful. Uh, we've had um, multiple donations from the congregation that I'll come back to. And from the community, we've had on the order of a couple hundred thousand dollars in donations. Uh, the congregation is small, but very passionate and has provided most of the donations. Um, we knew that community fundraising would be a challenge because many people and many businesses simply won't write a check to the church, no matter how hard we explain the whole historic preservation effort is totally divorced from the religious organization and its operating budget. So we created in 2017 a separate nonprofit, the Friends of the Meeting House, to lead the effort with community fundraising. Um, we've done somewhat well with that, as I said, about 200,000 from the community over these years. Where we have failed is on finding the probably small handful of potentially very large donors in the community who would make up the kind of gifts that we require for the goals that we have. Mm -hmm. We need uh, another million or a million and a half to finish everything. The largest gifts we've received have been uh, between 50 and 75,000, only a few of those, and very little of that scale from community members rather than church members. The perception we're fighting against is that um, everyone loves a historic building, it's on a main road, it's part of the whole um, historic tourism draw of dairy. It's on the dairy town seal. It's photos in all kinds of publications and business lobbies. Everyone loves it. Um, most people think it's on the church to uh, maintain it. And that's been our biggest struggle. Um, so uh, you talk about long-term projects in boner and fatigue. Um, I offer that as some encouragement kind of a longer scale thing than than I think uh, is happening elsewhere in the state, frankly. And uh, we've had some great successes, but not quite enough of them. Mm -hmm. So that's our story. Great story. Important portrait, Paul. Thank you for sharing that. I am going to wrap it up just to watch people's time, but um, I'll stay on for a little bit longer if anybody wants to chat. Um, thank I have you to so leave much. I'm sorry. Okay. I have to leave. For, for sharing your information and questions. It makes a huge difference. I uh, appreciate very much um, Bob and Byron's time and Nicole for being part of the team. Um, we are going to, for those of you who have done the previous programs, you know we send out a very short survey afterwards. Um, we'll let you know when we post the video of this if you want to share it with anybody else. Um, and I'll send out a, some links um, that I hope will be helpful. Um, we have some write-ups of other kind of fundraising tips that you can zoom through and see if they're helpful to you. Um, and I guess most of all, I just wanted to say thank you for so much for all the work you're doing in communities. And I think um, staying creative and taking your vitamins and asking for help seems like some pretty important themes of these um, big complicated projects. Thank you so much for working on them and uh, hope we can help you get to the, to the end goal. So. Thank you. Jennifer, I had a comment about the um, online donations for the, oh, thank you. Um, yep. the fee. Uh, one of the things that I have seen and it is very successful is on those donation pages, whether it's PayPal or Venmo or whatever it is. If you um, add a line in there that says, if you want your full contribution to go to the thing, you can also prepay that fee for the organization. Um, and so for some of them, it is an option on the donation page. Um, so check that out because that's one of the things you can do is um, ask them if they want their full $25 to go to it, ask them to pay that fee. Um, yeah. And the other thing is for large donations, you can also ask them uh, in lieu of supporting on this could you send a physical check, you know? Those are great points. Thank you for remembering that loose end and I loved yeah. your answers, that's great. Um, yeah. Pledge fulfillment from Julie, that's a really good question. Um, so wondering kind of at the beginning, what, what's an optimum number of years and then sort of making the point about 
things can take a while, right? And I know it's energy and administrative capacity to make sure you are following up. Um, do you have a, a set, set, set number of years that you've already um, shared with donors? Did you yes, and, and we extended during because of COVID because people might be feeling financial strain. So it was originally yeah. a three-year pay and it went to four. That seems really appropriate. Is that causing you problems at all, or no? Like but but people's um, anticipated um, pay in, you know, they gave an anticipated calendar of pay in, and at the time they made their pledge, and of course their pay ins are lagging. Part, no doubt because we extended the pay in period and didn't ask for an updated schedule. Um, so um, our forecast is, you know, behind. Um, monies are coming in nicely, but behind. And I, we're just looking ahead going, well, what percentage should we assume is never coming in? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do we, what should we be doing as we go along to make sure people remember <laughs> is it a lot of people? Yeah. Is it a hundred yeah. people or is it yeah. 20, a hundred? Yeah. I, I think I, are you uh, maybe prioritize like just maybe simple email or letter works for most of them. And then the ones you're most concerned about are the ones with the biggest zeros. You have a little, um, you're probably already doing this. You have a little plan I knew it would give me anxiety, but to have a plan, it would make me feel better. And if you had some people who would just do personal follow-ups with the handful that you felt were most um, critical. We're halfway through, two, two years through, and I don't think we've done any like even follow-up letter. Like, this is where we are. This is what you pledged. This is how much you paid oh, in. Yeah, you Should we be doing to, that on a- You gotta do that. You do, you need to send reminders. People need to- and little good news reminders, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. How often? Annually, semi-annually, quarterly? At least, at least, at least annually. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, if you're having, I mean, and and semi-annually would not be, you know, I, I mean, the thing is that most people, you know, when they make a multiple year pledge, they plan to make, you know, those year those annual payments. Mm -hmm. and often they, I think they need the, the larger organizations that, that I give to, and I'm not a major donor, but if I make a capital campaign commitment, you know, they send me a reminder and say, you know, this is where you stand in paying your pledge. Mm -hmm. You pledged X amount, you paid Y amount and you owe Z amount, you know, and that, that way it's like, it's to me, for somebody like me who had, can easily forget, it's, oh yeah, I've got to write that check. So yeah, I mean, if you haven't been sending any reminders out to these annual, you know, pledges, uh, you need to get right on that. That's that's probably why you're seeing uh, those payments not come in. It's just because it's out of their mind or they're mm -hmm. preoccupied. I mean, some Can of them. You share maybe... some good news as you're doing it. Yeah. yeah. Can I throw a piece in on that too, please? Yeah. Um, one of the things that we do is, I first of all we write a quarterly newsletter. It's a 12 page newsletter and it covers a lot of ground, but it, it not only covers what we're doing on the project, but we also provide um, information about the historical society. And we have a, a once a, every newsletter, we have a feature of a, a, like a bio of a person who's been in town for all their lives, basically. Um, so we, we highlight someone. The other thing that we've, we've done is in the newsletter, we've put in supplements that say, here's what the, you know, here's the latest big news on our, our project. Um, and what I'm gonna do right now is um, we, we, uh, we didn't have a lot to say <laughs> in the last newsletter about what, what we had done over the winter because it was more planning and it just didn't work out that we got a lot of work done in the building. But by June, uh, hopefully we will have a lot of work done or underway. So I'm, what we're planning on doing is sending out a one page double-sided um, uh, flyer that says, you know, here's an update um, on where we are with the building right now. 
include with that a, um, a donation form um, so that people and, and an envelope to mail it back too. So that we, we're not only giving them an update, but we're saying, you know, here's the, here's the next part of what we're looking for. So part of it is gonna, that is gonna be, here's what we've done. And the other side of the page should be, here's where we're going. Here's what we need to do to get us to that finish line. So that, that's, that, you know, so I, I heard Byron mention earlier, a quarterly newsletter. And one of my questions was how often, you know, should we communicate? Should it be monthly? Should it be, you know, the newsletter and then every in between, you know, like a single page flyer or something? I think it's really up to you. It depends upon the bandwidth of your organization and the people you have. I mean, one okay. of the things I heard Jennifer say is, uh, you know, these are small organizations and, and you may not have people, you know. I mean, for example, I was going to say your 12 page newsletter is, 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 from my perspective, maybe daunting to some organizations. You don't have to do a 12 page newsletter. I mean, yeah. I think it's great that you do it and it sounds like it's very meaty. Yeah. Meaty. You know, there's lots in it. Yes. But, you know, you don't. It's not necessary to send that large a newsletter. You could certainly do a single page or, or as I said, you know, do an email, you know, an e-newsletter. If it's easier and it saves you postage and you have all the email addresses that are, that are, that are valid. Yeah. Uh, and again, it, you, know, you need to tailor this to your organization. There is no go fast golden rule. It has to be quarterly. It has to be semi-annually. You know, when we're talking about pledges, that needs, as I said, that needs to be, I think, annually because people made it an annual pledge and they need a reminder. Uh, but in terms of, and, and I agree with Jennifer, if you can include some good news with that, oh, we just won this award, we've made this progress, that's great because that keeps the people engaged. Remember I said it's about telling your story and looking for opportunities to tell your story. And that's an opportunity. You're sending something to them anyway, so you may as well help to, to, to continue to engage them by telling the story. But again, really, it's uh, it's really depends on on, on your your organization, you know, uh, uh, how many people you have working on this, what your bandwidth is, you know. And I think you you'll know what people are responding to. You might be in a community of people who, you know, really aren't looking at Facebook but love getting together, um, you know, for photo for a, a work day or um, connect in some other way. Personal notes, if you have somebody who loves to write notes. Um, and I think just, and then without making yourself crazy, reflecting on that now and then saying, is what we've been doing still feel like it's working and still a good use of our time? Chuck? Never miss a chance to say it's tax deductible. <laughs> good point. Anymore, a little bit. <laughs> well, it, it may be tax deductible. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's become an issue with some of our donors where they've either uh, what is the rule now you can either take a flat deduction or you have to have over a certain yeah. amount yeah and uh, we've yeah. got to get caught in the middle so i've changed that on the bottom of our thing that says Bartlett historical is a 501c3 blah nonprofit. Yeah. donations may be tax deductible because i can't guarantee it anymore yeah the, the 2017 uh tax uh, uh whatever they called it but the tax cut change things around so that the individual deduction can far exceed what most people give, you know, yeah. unless you get above $24,000 or something right. a year, then it's the standard deduction covers it. But, but, but uh, one thing I did want to mention that, that Jennifer touched on is the personal note, which means if you send a letter, if you send an e a, a newsletter, if you have members of the board or the staff who have a personal connection to somebody, and can write a handwritten note saying, we really appreciate your support, hope things are doing well, something personal, that's also a very good thing to do. Yeah. It's a little yeah, one, that, but. Yeah, one suggestion with that is if you have historic photos or recent photos, you can inexpensively get them printed up as a postcard and you can send that as the thank you, but also have a bundle of those that they could purchase. Um, and if they are big donors, think about giving them something little that doesn't cost you that much that might spur them to give you more. Um, that yeah. whole thing, if you give someone something, then they feel compelled. Nice job, Paul. Yeah. Beautiful photograph. There's a That's, good example. That's uh, one, of, one of our thank you cards. Yeah. 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 
Two channels I, I, I might mention um, that haven't come up. Your local social clubs, the Lions, the Rotaries and things are typically both filled with community leaders and influencers and starving for presenters at their monthly meetings. If you have some interesting story <laughs> to tell, uh, see if you can get in front of them and, yeah. and uh, tell that story to their group. Yeah. In addition, your local media is in the same boat. They're usually really hungry for good content, good stories, and surprisingly willing to work with you on uh, that if you can present it in the right way, which means pitch them on how this story you want to tell will be interesting to their readership, which is their job to entertain. We've had That's great coverage point. from all the local papers and WMUR yeah. basically whenever we've wanted it. So That's a great point. Make sure to send a little thank you note after it's covered. Thank you for helping us share the news. Um, to the questions in the chat, um, Julie, I'm sure there is a standard about um, pledges that are not paid. Boy, at the beginning, I would just assume they should be paid and they will be paid. I would at least, if you haven't done follow-up yet, I mean, I think it's good to be conservative and worry that some won't, but I don't think you have evidence yet to come up with that number. So. For now, I would say we're going to, with contact, these are going to come through. And as you start hearing back from people, maybe you'll come up with a conservative estimate of what you think won't be realized. But um, I, I would stay optimistic at this point in time. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I mean, I, I'm sure that there's an industry rule of thumb. I don't know what it is. I've never heard it. Yeah. And so. then in terms of the websites, um, I would love people's, <laughs> other people's experience with this. Um, um, Barbara has some. Um, we have a very, very small percentage of people that would make their donation through the website. Um, what triggers people is when we send out the newsletter, we enclose the contribution envelope and the membership envelope. And that's, we see a flood. As soon as we send out that newsletter, the next couple of weeks, we see a number of, of envelopes come through. And people will donate multiple times, but they're not donating a lot of money, but they will donate a couple of times a year sometimes. Um, but that we really get very little from the online. Yeah. I think it's changing for a lot of heritage organizations. I think having it as a possibility is really important. Just to, you know, if somebody wants to give during the middle, you know, at 11 p.m. and there's nobody on the other end of the phone or they don't they don't like writing checks. I think having a way to donate online is really important. Um, I refer to sort of GoFundMe campaigns when I was showing all my little triangle pyramid signs. And I there's been some incredibly successful GoFundMe campaigns for historic preservation projects recently. Um, I, I would say the ingredients are is that they're still thinking of them like a regular capital campaign. They're still thinking about who can give lead gifts. They're thinking about um, great communications, telling their story, following up with people, thanking people after they've made a donation. So it's a different platform. Instead of writing checks to a PO box, they're on the GoFundMe site, which is, you know, has great kind of peer fundraising stuff um, built in. So um, to me, that's a little nugget related to online fundraising where we, we're starting to see more success. And but when it, when it fails, I think people have thought, oh, it'll take care of itself because it's a cool platform and haven't brought the other kind of classic fundraising principles to that effort. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to have to drop off. It's been, it's been great. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to drop off. Yeah, we should probably all drop off. Yeah. Thank you all for contributing so much and good luck with what you're working on. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.